gracias por venir a la nueva sesión del seminario Rostros y Rostros de la Violencia. Hoy nos va a presentar su trabajo Jobs Montaigne eh, de la Universidad de Edimburgo y como se va a impartir en inglés la conferencia voy a, a cambiar de idioma. So first of all we would like to thank you Jobs for accepting the invitation and for participating in the, in the seminar Faces and Traces of Violence. Uh, we are very excited to to hear about bones and their influence in Zimbabwe. Um, Jos Fontaine is an uh, Africanist and lecturer in social anthropology at the University of Edinburgh. Some of his main research interests are the anthropology of landscapes, objects, things and materiality, the politics of memory, history, heritage, the past and places, all of which mainly in Africa and more specific, specifically in Zimbabwe, uh, which is a country he has been focusing on. He is the author of many articles and book chapters on those topics, as well as a, a member of the editorial team of two journals on African studies. And to name only one of his works, we have The Silence of Great Zimbabwe, Contested Landscapes and the Power of Heritage, published in 2006 and reprinted in 2008, which is the result of his doctoral thesis, I think, that also won the UK Oliver Richards Prize in 2004. He is a founding member of the Bones Collective, exploring the effective presence and emotive materiality of human remains at the Anthropology Department of the University of Edinburgh. And in 2009, he was elected to the prestigious Skull Lectureship by the Royal Anthropological Institute. Um, his latest book that isn't published yet, I believe, the one... There's two books I'm working on. Okay, yeah. so the one I have is The Politics of the Dead, The Power of Insurgency yeah. in Post-2000 Zimbabwe. Uh, and today he is going to focus on one particular chapter of the book, Remaking the Dead, Uncertainty and the Talk of Human Materials in Northern Zimbabwe. Thank you. Northern, uh, thank, you. thank you for that. And thank you for inviting me here. You know, when we're working in this, this stuff on exhuming dead bodies, there are two places in the world that are kind of leading this stuff. And one of them is Spain and one of them is Argentina. And it's been my great pleasure to be able to come to both in the last two weeks, <laughs> having been working on this stuff for several years. Um, and of course, it's very out of area for me as an Africanist, so I'm keen to see what uh, discussions we have. So, this paper is called Remaking the Dead, Uncertainty and the Talk of Human Materials, and it's part of this larger book project, um, Politics of the Dead and the Power of Uncertainty, uh, post 2000 Zimbabwe. And in fact, you know, the book, in a sense, is emerging out of a series of papers that I've been writing. So this is actually the third of a series of papers. And it was when I finished writing this paper that I realized that there was a book here. And the reason I think this paper, in a sense, is the most important paper in that book that I'm still writing is because it, it turns from a discussion of human materialities and human, to this question about uncertainty. And that happened. That's why in the book that I'm putting together, this is the middle of five chapters. Um, and it's part of this Bones Collective research group that we have in Edinburgh where, which we, I mean, sometimes it's just a coffee conversation, me and a colleague of mine, and sometimes we have a lot of events and publications, and so it's this kind of, it's, there's a sort of waxing wane into this. Um, and basically what we want to do with the Bones Collective is apply and think about recent debates about materiality and think about them in relation to human remains. Right, so the materiality of human remains. And the central to this was, you know, not asking what do bones and bodies mean, but what do they do? That's kind of the central motif, if you like, that we've been following up. Okay, so this paper um, looks at a very specific event in March 2011, when a group of war veterans known as the Fallen Heroes Trust uh, began exhuming hundreds of human remains from a mine in northern Zimbabwe called Chibondo. And this uh, was met with an awful lot of publicity uh, and controversy. And these photos are actually from the kind of the, the state newspaper. So this is the stuff that was being broadcast all over Zimbabwe. Okay, so this is this sort of my talk. This is the structure of it. So if you get lost, you know where you're at. Okay, that's, that's how we get. All right, so let me sort of give you the instruction. So in March 2011, amid sort of massive publicity, this group of war veterans, the Fallen Heroes Trust, began exhuming hundreds of human remains from a disused mine at Chibondo in northern uh, Zimbabwe, claiming that these were victims 
of Rhodesian atrocities during the liberation struggle from the 1970s. Okay. These uh, exhumations were broadcast all over the television by the state newspaper and were involved, there was a lot of crude politicking going around, going on around them. Uh, there were people being bussed to the site, there was a lot of Zanapiev sloganeering going on, and it, immediately these exhumations and the crude politicking around them provoked uh, a lot of controversy. And the argument that I want to make in this paper is that ultimately these controversies turned on and were animated by the indeterminate qualities of the human materials uh, involved and the uncertainties that this provoked about the identity and age of the dead and how they were killed. Okay. So this indeterminate nature of the human materials um, then in turn raised all sorts of very difficult questions about whether all of these remains really were victims of Rhodesian <coughs> atrocities or whether they, in fact they included much more recent dead, people killed since independence. So in other words, it raised this difficult question about whether these were, if you like, Zanapiev heroes or Zanapiev victims. And then I want to suggest at the end that actually possibly the grotesque displays of these uncertain dead could also be part of a sort of stylistics of power of the ruling party, Zanapiev, in another way. In other words, it was not just in support of Zanapiev's sort of necropolitan imagination and its aesthetics of heroism, but also perhaps about demonstrating Sanapia's capacity for violence. Okay, so that this uncertainty was useful to me. Oh, excuse me. I was bad. <laughs> so um, I'm not there yet, actually. Sorry. So my purpose then is how were these questions about the identity of the dead and the manner of their deaths and who has sovereignty over them provoked by the excessive potentialities of the human substances being exhumed? And how are these indeterminate human materials being remade imperfectly and contingently into particular types of political bodies and subjects? And how did these materials themselves demand and enable and yet ultimately defy this reconstitution of the dead? And what might be the political usefulness of the uncertainties provoked by this excessive potentiality of human materials? In other words, could Zanipiev both celebrate their liberation heroes and, at the same time, remind people of their own capacity for violence. Then I'm going to suggest, ultimately, however, that if there was this kind of, if there was a political utility to this uncertainty, it was only, kind of, it was limited in time. It was only useful for a brief period of time. Uh, and ultimately, the uncontained uncertainties were unsustainable. And indeed, by August 2011, August the same year, all the exhumed remains had been reburied, in a new grave at the site, and the mine was sealed. Okay. So that, in a sense, is the short version of my paper. Right. <laughs> now I'll now give you the long version. <laughs> so, because there, I think there is an important background here. I think in recent years there's been this new zeitgeist of interest in questions of corporeality. Um, and indeed, a lot of it, I think, is coming from work going on here in Spain. And this relates to a kind of renewed attention to the complex entanglement of the politics of the past with that of these material remains, performative practices and monumentalization. And there's this renewed focus on what Florence Bevanot is called carnal fetishism. And we can ask whether this is a return to much older questions that were first raised by Hertz, and I think to some extent that is true. At the same time, there's a question that I haven't quite resolved yet, and I think is made perhaps unresolvable. You know, is this renewed academic interest in human materiality or corporeality, does this reflect broader cultural changes? And I'm thinking here of, say, the popularity of forensic programs on television. I mean, it's everywhere, right? If you start looking for it, everywhere, CSI, etc. Et or is this the result of new theoretical concerns? In the 90s, the whole embodiment turn, and in the 2000s, the whole materiality turn. Now, actually, I think the answer to this question is probably both, and the two are interrelated. Because I don't think academic discourse is that separate from the rest of the world. I think the two are intertwined, but how that works is, uh, it is perhaps a great area. At any rate, I think there is this, um, new, like, this new zeitgeist of interest into how the politics of memory, corporeality, and materiality are linked across the region. So, this is both a particular Africanist thing, but also far beyond. Now, in Zimbabwe, the politics of the past and of its remains have long been salient. And yet, 
you know, so this precedes the last decade. And yet, at the same time, I think in the last decade, we can identify a kind of heightened politics of the dead, and that's what I want to talk about now. So this more specific context. So the politics of the dead uh, has a long history in Zimbabwe, and there are different dimensions to it. Firstly, there are these long-standing complaints about ZANU-PF, the ruling party, <coughs> It's particularly partisan and elitist control of national commemoration of the liberation struggle. The picture there on the top right is the National Heroes Aid. Now, the comp these long-standing complaints, and they date right back to the early 1980s, the independence period, is really that ZANU-PF has excluded uh, other nationalist parties, other uh, nationalist armies, guerrilla armies, and other individuals, and particularly ZAKU. So liberation was... You know, there were two nationalist groups, ZAKU and ZANU, each had their armies, and because ZANU kind of won, they set it up, and basically National Heroes has been dominated by ZANU. So ZAKU and ZIPRA continue to be very upset that they're being marginalised. Now, this goes back to the early 1980s. However, since 2000, we had this re-emergence of this new uh, nationalist rhetoric of what Terence Ranger has called patriotic history, this new political rhetoric. And through this... Uh, in the last decade or more, ZANU-PF has arrogated exclusively to itself the liberation credentials and legacies and languages of suffering, and it's used this to marginalise more recent opposition groups. So the MDC, the MDC opposition groups, just are constantly being excluded because they don't have a liberation uh, legacy to draw upon, and they've done this very effectively. So that's one aspect of politics of the day. But another aspect, there are these other sort of more bottom-up, if you like, continuing complaints about the failures of state commemoration. So if you look very closely, and obviously I've been working in Zimbabwe for uh, you know, almost 20 years, you see that there have been these increasing calls for the return and the reburial of war dead from mass graves across Zimbabwe's uh, rural areas, but also in Mozambique and Zambia, where there were substantial guerrilla camps. Now, again, this has been a long issue. Uh, you know, this has been an issue since the 1980s and 90s, and yet in the last 10 years, it's become uh, much more heightened. And uh, So there are increasing cases of war veterans, spirit mediums, and families actually doing their own exhumations. Right? Um, there are also increasing cases of human remains resurfacing from graves. So there are loads of accounts. If you look at newspaper reports over the last 10 years, you see loads of accounts of farmers who plough up human remains in fields and so on. In a sense, these human remains come back to themselves. And there are these uh, cases of the unsettled dead as spirits coming back, haunting relatives, haunting uh, their comrades, and haunting Zimbabwe's post-colonial milieu. Um, and indeed, these com all of these kinds of complaints have fed into national museums, the sort of national heritage <coughs> organisations, who in the last 15 years or so have really taken on board this so-called liberation heritage project. And these kinds of complaints are fed into National Museum's Liberation uh, Project. And this is interesting because this Liberation Heritage Project is partly UNESCO sponsored and it is a kind of regional program. So at one level, National Museums is responding to a very specific ZANU PF patriotic history. On another level, it's responding to bottom up demands on the ground, but it's also integrated into this regional program. So it's quite an interesting project. And I, in fact, I want to do more work on this. So, those are the, that's the second aspect of the politics of the dead in Zimbabwe. But the third aspect, and this is important, is that the politics of the dead in Zimbabwe is not just about the legacies um, of, of the liberation struggle, it's also about post-colonial violence. And this is much more sensitive and much more problematic, and particularly the highly sensitive unresolved issue of the Kukuru Hundi killings of the 1980s. This was when... Um, ZANU PF in the 1980s, in its struggles against ZAKU, sent the Korean 5th Brigade into Matabeliland and the Midlands, and they killed an estimated 20,000 people. Right. So it's, it's a very serious issue. Um, and ever since that time, the government still obstructs all efforts by Matabeli activists to commemorate the Kukuhundi dead, to rebury them, and so on. And in the last 10 years, you see heightened demands for this. In fact, if you watch Zimbabwe news now, a week doesn't go by without some Matabeliland activist group saying we need to deal with Gugul Hundi and the government constantly obstructs this. You, know, you see this all the time. Um, 
So that's one aspect of the kind of post-colonial dimension of this politics of the dead. And of course the other aspect is the escalating violence of the 2000s. And this is particularly here the elections of 2008, when hundreds of people were killed and disappeared, and thousands of people were beaten up and brutalized. So the politics of the dead isn't just about resurfacing bones and the unsettled spirits of, from past violence, but it's also about the tortured bodies of recent election violence and a new politics of burial that accompanied this. So in 2008, what you also see is that not only were people being beaten up and killed, but there was also, you know, when, when opposition groups tried to bury their recent dead, they were obstructed. There was a new kind of politics of burial going on. So... Not quite there yet. So the politics of the dead long predates the grisly exhumations that took place in northern Zimbabwe in 2011, and it's deeply animated by these resurfacing bones of past colonial and post colonial violence. It's animated by the leaky, tortured bodies of very recent political violence, and it's animated by the spirits of the dead who return as these avenging and gauzy spirits demanding to be returned home. Now, the haunting presence of these spirits is important because it's intimately intertwined with the effective presence and emotive materiality of bones, bodies, and human substances. And I think they're linked by the way in which they reveal or manifest the transgression of normalizing processes whereby people, both living and dead, are constituted, transformed, and made safely dead. And this is important because this is why exhumations and reburials are often seen as a form of healing. It's a way of correcting transgressions, a way of making people safely dead. And yet even when there is this general agreement about the cathartic or healing potential of exhumations and rebellions, often these processes are intensely contested and disputed. Okay. So this is where I want to show you this clip briefly to show these are photos from the Chibondo exhumations that are, you can see these on the, the, the Herald, the state newspaper. But also this stuff was being broadcast on television. And the clip I want to show you is actually from a Chinese news channel. But it's the kind of thing that Zimbabweans were being shown every day. Um, so here we go. Where is it? That one, is it? No, not that one. Hope we don't get the other. so hard to avoid the adverts. Uh, got them anyway. Okay. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to show you that, and it becomes important in a minute, is that clearly these were decidedly unforensic exhibitions, right? And that became quite important. 
Okay, so these exhumations, which kind of burst onto the public scene in March 2011, immediately provoked controversies. And these controversies reflected the topography of the politics of the dead that I've just been talking about. Okay? So, uh, the first round of complaints, if you like, were, uh, were, were focused on, you know, why is ZANU-PF exhuming these bodies now and in this way? They were focusing on the way in which ZANU-PF was using this for its own propaganda purposes. Yeah, and so there were complaints about the TV coverage, the kind of ZANU-PF sloganeering, the bus tours. I mean, thousands of people were bused to see this. School children from local schools were taken there, etc., etc. So people were complaining about this gross politicisation, this whipping up of emotions, and there were discussions about new elections and so on. And the, you know, a lot of people said, well, why are we doing this now? Now, what's interesting is that actually they weren't just doing this now. The Fallen Heroes Trust have been doing this for a long time. But I guess the question is, why is this now being surrounded in this kind of publicity? And of course, these kinds of uh, complaints focus also on the partisan nature of these war veteran exhumations. And this immediately, the sort of second aspect of this, is immediately all of those groups who felt, have long felt excluded from state commemoration said, well, if you guys are digging up your dead, we want to dig up our dead. So former Zaku and Zipa comrades immediately started demanding their own exhumations. And for Zaku, former Zipa guys, this was a particularly sore point because just the year before they had planned an exhumation of some Zipa guerrillas who had been killed at the end of the war, and at the very last moment this had been obstructed by the government again. So this was a you know this was a very sore point for them. Um, and of course, linked to this, because there is a link between Zaku and the whole Kukuhundi thing, is that there were immediately there were new calls for the Kukuhundi dead too to be exhumed. These Kukuhundi dead, who for so long had been deliberately ignored. And so for many Matabeliland activists, uh, this was, as one person explained it to me, you know, this whole event was reminded them that really the dead are not equal. Right? So the leader of Zapu said, look, ZANU-PF should extend the program to victims of the Kukuhundi to prove its sincerity. And of course, thirdly, questions were also raised about other more recent dead. So MDC supporters killed and disappeared in the last decade. People started saying, well, we, we, if you guys are, ZANU-PF is digging up its dead, we want to dig up our dead. Where are our dead? Thirdly, the immediate kind of controversies were also about the manner of the exhumations. And this was coming particularly from human rights activists. And these kinds of critiques focused on the decidedly crude and unsophisticated exhumations, uh, which you saw in the video, I think, the absence of pathologists, the absence of any forensic expertise, and which many human rights activists described as this is very disrespectful. And particularly Sherry Eppel, um, who's a very prominent human rights activist who was involved in the 90s in this brief period of time when Kukuhundi exhumations were possible with Argentinian expertise. Uh, she uh, put out various reports very quickly uh, critiquing uh, these war veteran led exhumations, saying that these were silencing uh, the bones and, and really emphasizing that only forensic expertise would allow the bones to speak. And indeed, in the next slide, this is from one of the reports that she put out very quickly. And you can see what she did was she juxtaposed positions from photographs from the uh, exhumations that had taken place in the 90s with the Argentinian team against photos from Mount Darwin to say, look, this is how it should be done, this is what you're doing, this is terrible. Right? Okay. Now, the fallen heroes, the war veterans, uh, they responded to these kinds of critiques by saying, look, we don't need forensic science. We use African methods. We use spirit. Uh, possession, divination, um, and and of course, you know this wasn't just. They have actually been using divination, spirit possession for a very long time. If you look at the reports, this goes back ten years, and there were reports of them, um, people, children, relatives of the dead getting possessed by the dead, going into a mine and choosing their own bones. You know, for example, there are examples of this, and this goes back a lot longer than than this event. Um, and of course, you know, the war veterans were very much stressing the resolution of suffering that their exclamations were offering. Uh, and of course, they were stressing along the lines of ZANU-PF's own rhetoric, you know, the horrors of Rhodesian atrocities that they were revealing. Okay. Now, the government's response to this, 
at first they were just letting this go on and they were, you know, the ZANU-PF, the ruling party, it was a moment of the government of national unity, but the ruling party was dominant in this government of national unity. And from, from, for the first part, they were just allowing this publicity to go on because it was kind of suiting their purposes. However, I think quite quickly, some people in ZANU-PF began to recognize that there were problems here and they needed to legitimize these exhumations. And this is why in, in April, national museums were drafted in. And they said, well, you guys do liberation heritage anyway, go over there and do this project. And what's interesting is that within a few months, the exhumations were closed down, the mine was sealed. Um, and I've also heard indirectly that I think within ZANU-PF, which is a very fractious party, there was a lot of disagreement. So some people were very keen on this, other people weren't. And it kind of ties in with regional politics and so on. All right, so, so that, if you like, is the kind of broad initial controversies. But very soon, other questions were being asked, much more serious questions. And partly these questions were the result of the publicity itself. They were the result of the images and the videos being shown, because people started to say, well, hang on. These remains, they look too fresh. They look too intact. They look too fleshy, too leaky. They're too stinky. Do they really date back 30 years? So, uh, for, for example, one, this report here, a journalist who witnessed the exercise was shocked to see the bodies were still intact. They had hair, their clothes, their fluids dripping from it, it stinks, and so on. And then, you know, another report, an unidentified pathologist said, look, there shouldn't be a stink, and so on. So, there was this uncertainty that was coming from the nature of the materials themselves. And it, interestingly, it wasn't just the materials, the human stuff, that was provoking this uncertainty. It was also the objects and the material culture, if you like, found around them, the, the artifacts, particularly the, sh the shoes, the clothes, and the uniforms. So, Ambuya Vazarila, she's a spirit medium in the south of the country who I've worked with for a very long time. I interviewed her in December that year, and she had been bussed there with her son. And she said, look, you know, they, you know we were shocked to find that they were still wearing their clothes. Is it possible that bodies would still be wearing clothes after 30 years? There were also rumours going around that cell phones, plastic ID cards, uh, Zimbabwe National Army tags had been found amongst these remains, and all of, course, all of these things post-state independence. So there's a real question here. Now, what's interesting is that the, the, these kind of critiques about whether they really were, uh, really did date to the liberation struggle, the war veterans responded to this. Firstly, they dismissed these claims, these are not fresh bodies. But they also, in making their arguments, pointed to the stuff the objects, the non-human stuff, if you like, to support their arguments that these were war liberation, you know, liberation war dead, they were, in a sense, heroes. And particularly the, the super pro camera shoes, shown here, there, on, on the bottom. Um, because it was well known that guerrilla fighters often wore these particular shoes during the 70s, and so they were saying, look at these shoes. And, you know, they also pointed to un other uniforms and camouflage that was found, you know, saying these dated to that area. Um, and, and I come back to this, but it, it seems to me, I think it's interesting that the indeterminacy of the human materials raises these questions, and in response to that, everyone points to the non-human stuff, which somehow is more stable. Right. I'll come back to that. <coughs> so, um, this, the, the unexpectedly fleshy and intact, uh, intact and stinky nature of these human remains raise these very urgent questions and uncertainties about the age and therefore the identity of the dead and the manner of their deaths. And this meant that very soon concerns were not only being raised about other dead that needed to be exhumed elsewhere, but about whether these Chabonda remains themselves included those other dead, included people uh, killed by Zanapia violence since independence. So the uncertain nature of the human materials provoked these sensitive questions. Who were the Chabondo dead? So Ambuya Vazagira, who I mentioned before, her son said, look, probably there are bodies from the liberation struggle there, but maybe there are also body, bodies from other periods of violence, from the Gugurundi and maybe from the elections of recent years, and even Chiazwa. Chiazwa is where they found diamonds, and there were several hundred people who were killed there and, uh, when the army took over the diamond mines, and no one really knows what happened to those bodies. Now, uh, interesting, you know, so they said, look, there are many periods in Zimbabwe's recent past where parents lost their children and don't know where they're buried. 
Uh, John Mahumbe, who's a very famous, who was a very famous political uh, academic, political activist, who unfortunately died a year or two ago. He said, look, it, the truth of the matter is that not all of these skeletons are from atrocities committed by the colonial the Smith regime. The Mugabe government has also used the same burial place to dumb its own skeletons. How many victims of the work of the CIO, that's the secret intelligence agency, uh, greatly feared in Zimbabwe, are among the skeletons being exhumed today? So then everyone, all these other groups, got on board on the same bandwagon. So other nationalist parties, the Kukuhundi activists, they all started saying, well, maybe the Chibondo remains included um, victims from the 1980 violence between Zapu, Zipra, and the Kukuhundi. So, Zapu, one of the spokesmen, said, we're afraid that the Zanapiak managed exhumations may be used to cover up evidence of the Kukuhundi atrocities. MDC opposition group said, maybe the Chibondo remains included recent, much more recent victims of Zanapiak violence. So one state, one MDC spokesman said, look, these bodies look fresh. Those remains are MDC who were killed by Zanu in 2008. Now this uncertainty uh, about the identity of the dead provoked by the indeterminate nature of the materials also raised new questions about the decidedly unforensic nature of the exhumations. So now people were wondering whether the crude and decidedly unforensic Methods were not just chaotic, unprofessional, or disrespectful, but perhaps a deliberate attempt to cover up evidence. So it raised this question, was Chibondo a war grave or a crime scene? And was using divination and spirit possession a deliberate effort to obscure the truth, a way, a deliberate way of silencing the bones? Sherry, e Sherry Eppel, who I mentioned before, the human rights activist, um, they, you know, they use these arguments about the uncertain nature of the materials to emphasise the need for professional forensic involvement. And she said, look, what looks like fresh remains may actually be mummified remains. I don't know, apparently this is an effect of, of mass burial. Um, but she said, look, it's not impossible that these graves contain victims from the 1980s, but really... Um, you know, the ambivalence and uncertainty surrounding the material qualities of these remains could only be determined by professional forensic anthropologists. So she was saying, yes, Zimbabwe needs exhumations and they need the healings that they offer, but it needs to be done by professionals. That was her kind of point. And so she was very active in lobbying to stop the exhumations. And in fact, um, she, she, I, I interviewed her and she was explaining how Matabela land activists were coming to her door saying, look, Zanapiak for digging up their dead, let's dig up her, our dead. And then she was saying, no, let's, let's not do that. And so she organised with them and they went to Bulawayo court and they got a court order to, to stop uh, the exhumations. And when I spoke to them in December, they said, look, we stopped the exhumations. But actually, I'm not sure they did. Because if you look at the... You know, clearly exhumations carried on and they only stopped, National Museums only got involved after the court order. And Zanapiaf often ignores court orders, particularly when they come from a, a town on the other side of the country. Um, of course, Zanapiaf's response to these kinds of critiques saying, look, these are not in defence of African uh, culture. Uh, and when the Prime Minister, the opposition Prime Minister in the national government of national un un unity, Chiang Rai, was criticising uh, the exhumations himself, they just dismissed him, saying, look, you're not defending African uh, culture, you're just talking cheap politics. Not there yet. So, what I'm kind of suggesting here is that the uncertain and indeterminate nature of the materials change the focus of the controversy surrounding the exhumations. From these critiques of the crew politicking and disrespectful nature of the exhumations to these much more sensitive questions about the true identity of the, of the dead and the real purpose of the unforensic uh, vernacular exhumations. And so activists stopped calling for other exhumations and instead lobbied for the prevention of any exhumation without proper forensic expertise. And kind of what I'm arguing is perhaps this uncertainty explains why after initially da drowning the uh, war veteran dead exhumations in publicity, very quickly, once the government moved in, they closed it down. Very quickly. They increased security at the site. Um, first, uh, the visits began to be highly choreographed, and then they were closed altogether. And perhaps it's this uncertainty would also 
uh, explained why suddenly questions about how human remains are remade into dead political subjects, how the dead are made present, how the past is reconstituted, became of such concern. And why the question of professional forensic involvement came to dominate the debates, even though everyone on all sides of this debate agreed in principle that exhumations and reburials can be cathartic. And I, I'm arguing that these questions were really raised by the indeterminate and yet demanding an excessive potentiality of human materials. And this is what I'm calling the talk of materiality. So now we get a bit of theoretical stuff. Right, so I mentioned that I've written other papers on this, using debates from materiality to explore the politics of the dead in Zimbabwe. So the first paper I wrote in 2009, what I was doing here, this is very kind of my first preamble into this stuff, was I was looking at the ambivalent agency of bones, using Gale and Latour. So bones, in a sense, they do stuff, both as extensions of the consciousness of the dead, these dead spirit subjects making demands on the living, but they also do stuff as kind of unconscious objects or things provoking responses from the living, right? So my first kind of was to try and use what bones do and thinking about Gale and Latour and how they both operate at the same time. The second paper, I was looking much more at tortured bodies and trying to think, well, if bones do something, what about all these tortured bodies, particularly after the 2008 elections? And what I did here was think about very much, I was influenced here by Tim Ingold's work and his critique of the materiality term and his stress on the properties and flows of materials to argue that violence against living people is linked to disruptions to funerals and burials because both interfere with normal, material, social and symbolic processes of containment and transformation through which materials are reconstituted as these peculiar object subjects, as these body persons, and through which fleshy bodies become bones persons become spirits and the living become safely dead, right? So in other words, interfering with someone when they're alive through violence is in a sense an interference of the process through which people are constituted. Interfering with people when people are dead is similar to that. You're interfering through the normalizing process through which people are constituted as dead, right? So you're linking violence against the living to violence against the dead. Now, in this paper, I want to push this argument further. Because Ingold's focus on materials, and in fact also Brown's work on thing theory, reverts attention to these processes of becoming, or constitutional stabilization, or what Latour calls purification, through which objects and indeed subjects are constituted. So then we can ask, well, how are bones and human remains sifted from the merged substances of decayed bodies, sand and soil, recognized or reconstituted as these uneasy human things, as these ambivalent subject objects through, say, archaeological excavation, forensic exhumation, or indeed through divination. So how then is archaeology, forensic anthropology, or divination about a process of remaking the dead? Okay. Now, there are other scholars who've worked on this, including scholars who've worked in Spain, so Zoe Crossland, who's worked on Argentina, but also Leila Renshaw. These, they too are focused on how anthropological, archaeological, and forensic practice brings the dead into being through exhumation and analysis. In another paper that I co-wrote with some of my Bones Collective colleagues, including this Filippucci at all, we've talked about this process of unearthing as a kind of a process of becoming by which traces of the past lives are reconstituted and come to assert this ambivalent quality of felt presence, which has the capacity to unsettle the here and now with an indeterminate alterity. Right? So in other words, this emphasis on becoming or remaking of the dead points to what Leila Renshaw has called the otherness of human remains. Right? Now this talk of human materiality, this excessive potentiality of, of human remains, it's important because, look, sometimes Tim Ingold has been critiqued for imagining this process of becoming as this kind of smooth, unproblematic, kind of romantic process, right? And indeed, others like Miller have talked about the dialectics of objectification, right? So people making things, making people. And the way in which this has been constructed is always in a very romantic, wholesome, kind of organic way, right? But others, 
like Chris Pinney, and this is why I think Chris Pinney is important, has stressed that this constant becoming is rife with disjunctures and fractures. And this is what he means when he talks about the talk of materiality. In other words, things, materials, and stuff are always both more and less than the objects and subjects that they constitute, become, or are made into. In other words, stuff, substances, things, always contain or maintain an excessive potentiality to exceed their constitution, stabilization, or purification into recognizable objects or identifiable subjects. And it's this excessive potentiality of stuff which means that processes of stabilization, of becoming, of remaking, are always open-ended, incomplete, uncertain, and ultimately indeterminate. And that is why they're often highly contested. And I think, in my view, the controversies that surrounded the Chibondo exhumations perfectly illustrate this argument. Okay? Um, in other words, this kind of argument reveals how the Chibondo controversies were provoked by the, the excessiveness of this stuff itself, the way in which demands stabilization but also defies it. Okay. But of course, this does raise a, a difficult question. You know, if this argument about the excessive potentiality of stuff applies to all stuff, how are human remains different? And I think they are different. But how are they different? And I think it, it, it applies... I think it applies to all things, but unusually for human remains. And this is where one of the things that we've been talking about in Edinburgh is about this distinction between metaphor and metonym. So maybe human remains signal presence much more readily than they do meaning. So again, from this paper we wrote, Philip Richardson, the problem of bones and human materials is that their excessive metonymic qualities defy, perhaps much more than other things, efforts to turn them into meaningful metaphors. And I think this helps us to understand how the controversies surrounding the Jobondo exhumations were provoked by the excessive potentialities of the human substances being exhumed by their profoundly evocative and affected, but unstable, uncertain, and, in, and ultimately indeterminate materiality. And I think this also explains why the objects and the artifacts found with them, the clothes, the shoes, the uniforms, took on such importance for, the, for both sides of the debate, because these objects offered much more stability of meaning than the human remains themselves. And of course, this also helps explain why so many of the debates came to turn upon the manner of the exhumations, right? Particularly this tension which became very deep between forensic and divinatory approaches, right? Even though everyone on all sides of this debate agreed that exhumation and reburial can be cathartic and healing. Right? And of course, the interesting point, and I want to push this more, and I'll be interested to see what people here have to say about this, is that this argument about the talk of materiality actually also suggests that neither divination or forensic science are necessarily very good at remaking the dead, right? At least identifying them, in the absence of extensive contextual work to make them meaningful. And one of the arguments that I write in the chapter that follows this one in the book that I want to pursue is this idea that actually, ultimately, there is no closure, right? There is no stabilization. We can talk about that later. So therefore, what I'm saying is that the excessive potentiality of the human stuff makes remaking the dead, however you approach it, a profoundly uncertain, indeterminate process, and that's why it's often unusually problematic, politicized, and contested. Now, I'm coming to the end, but there's one more thing I want to talk about, right? Which is what's on this slide, so you might already get it. Because one of the things that occurred to me was, how might these uncertainties provoked by this stuff have been politically useful? Politics is sometimes assumed to be about the contested work of determination and the elimination of doubt and uncertainty, right? So one person says it's this, another person says it's this. Different, you know, the, the contest is between different ways of stabilizing meaning, right? But I'm wondering whether perhaps this uncertainty might be part and parcel of the performative stylistics of power. Now, uncertainty is very vogue in anthropology. I think of it as the new ambiguity. Um, and often as with a lot of terms in anthropology, references to it are very vague, but I'm using it in a very specific term here, very specific sense. Can we link the uncertainties of the stuff, the materials, to the productive uncertainties 
that often surround rumours, gossip and political satire, for example. And I'm thinking here particularly of Vishali Mbembe's work on, in his book on the post-colony, where he talks about cartoons, he, he looks at cartoons from Cameroon that satirise the political elite. Now, at first glance, these cartoons satirising the political elite could be said to critique the political elite. But his argument is the opposite. He says these cartoons, although they seem to critique them, actually rarefy the presence of the elite. Everyone is talking about them. Okay. So then I'm wondering whether the rumours and the controversies that surround the Chibondo exhumations, provoked by the indeterminate nature of the materials, could also have been useful. At one level, they seem to challenge ZANAPF's crude efforts to remake these dead into their heroes. But at the same time, perhaps they also served ZANAPF interests by reminding everyone of its profound capacity for violence. So, in other words, perhaps like rumours and satire, the uncertainties of the bodies and the bones and the human remains not only provokes the complexity of meanings, but also has these duplicious political effects. Now, um, if political authority always depends on this combination of legitimacy and sovereignty, then perhaps the uncertainties provoked by the exhumed remains allowed Zanipia for a time to have it both ways. They could use the exhumations to celebrate their heroes and inflate their own anti colonialist rhetoric and legitimacy, and they could remind everyone of their own capacity for violence. Right? And we have to think that this was particularly in the context of ongoing debates about new elections. Right? Even in 2011, people were saying, we're going to have new elections. Zanavir wanted to regain political hegemony. There was a lot of concern that 2008, the violence in 2008, would be, would be repeated. I think this also offers an explanation for the grotesque politicking, the bus tours, the school visits, the ZPC jingles, and also the decidedly unfriended nature of the exclamation. In other words, this gross politicking wasn't just about reinforcing ZANAPF's anti-colonialist legitimacy and patriotic history. It was also a performative exercise, demonstrating again, as Mbembe puts it, that the ultimate expression of sovereignty resides in the power to exercise control over mortality. It's what he calls necropolitics. And indeed, there is some sense that people were aware of this at the time. So this quote comes from one MDC opposition spokesman. He said, look, those villagers, the ones being bussed and shown into the mine, know that many of those remains are MDC activists, but they are too scared to say it. That's why Zanapiev is now instilling fear by showing them those remains. This shows that we are again not going to have free and fair election. There was a sense, some people sense that this recognised that this might be going on. So what I'm kind of suggesting is that some people in ZANU-PF, and I certainly wouldn't say all, but some people, recognise the political purchase or usefulness of the indeterminate nature of the materials. Okay. Now, an important caveat here, and it's, it is an important caveat, is that I don't think that this argument I'm trying to make relies on any the existence of any kind of Machiavellian political intentions, right? I don't think that someone in ZANU-PF was saying, let's dig up these uncertain dead and make everyone think that maybe they were, they are our victims, maybe our heroes. I don't think the political effect for it to work needs that kind of intention behind it, right? I think these political effects exist regardless of any design, right? So I'm not making a kind of conspiracy argument here. Right? More importantly, and, and, and kind of extending from this, I think this kind of performative politics of uncertainty actually fits an emerging pattern that circulates in other contexts around the political efficacy of rumours. So in a completely different paper I published a few years ago, I was looking at urban clearances in Zimbabwe in 2005, where they, just, I don't know if you heard of this, they destroyed, you know, houses everywhere. They made 200,000 people homeless in about three weeks in informal housing, right? And I've argued very much that the rumours to do with this had these two effects. At one level, they were appealing to a kind of <coughs> uh, an appeal to order and bureaucracy. At the same time, they're also demonstrating quite how powerful they are, that they had the capacity to do this. And that this duplicitousness worked in both ways. Another example, and this is the one that, in the chapter I'm still trying to write, of where rumours have this duplicitous role, is, is, is to do with the frequent accidental deaths or murders of leading politicians. And there are so many examples of this in the last 20 years. 
senior ZANU-PF politicians who die in accidents, right? Who die in political in, in road accidents, who then become national heroes, and there is a plethora of debate about who killed them. Okay. And again, I think, and this is the chapter I'm still writing. In fact, in August that year, August 2011, one of a very leading ZANU-PF figure, Solomon Mujul, said to be the, one of Mugabe's co closest confidants, uh, liberation guerrilla war leader, right? People described him as ZANU-PF kingmaker. He died in a very mysterious fire on his farm. And the, the chapter I'm still writing is about this, and about how the uncertainties... And everyone who talked to Zimbabwe will say he was assassinated. And there was a court case, and it's unresolved. And interestingly, that court case turned a lot on the ambiguous and not very professional role of a pathologist. So again, it turns on the nature of the materials. You know, how could this guy die in this fire? And, and so on and so forth. So there's a sense in which this politics of uncertainty and of, of rumours doesn't just exist here. It exists in different fora, in different contexts. And again, perhaps these rumours too of people who died in accidents, but maybe <coughs> assassinations, at one level they seem to challenge Zanapia for legitimacy, but they also seem to reify its power, its sovereignty, and its necropolitics. But of course, and this is, really is the end, I promise, um, there is a limit to this argument. Because this uncertainty, by its very nature, works both ways. There's always, the possibility always remains that this uncertainty will subvert that other aspect of political authority, that is legitimacy. And of course, in August 2011, the Chibondo remains were reburied. And rumours had it, the mine was sealed. There was a brief newspaper announcement about a monument they built there, and then the issue disappeared from the news. Completely. So it seems that ultimately the uncertainties about the identity of the dead and the manner of their deaths provoked in part by the materials themselves, were not actually sustainable or easily containable. Okay? When I was in Zimbabwe in December that year, I talked to a lot of people about this. I said, what happened? You know, this was such a big issue from March, April, May, June, and then it disappeared. And it closes. What happened? And people were saying, well, you know, ZANU-PF became alarmed that things at Chibondo had got out of hand. So the possibility that the remains at Chibondo included victims of ZANU-PF's violence were perhaps too threatening to the legitimacy of its patriotic history project. And perhaps they outweigh any benefits that it may have accrued from grotesque displays of its ability to exercise control over mortality. So in the end, and to put it very crudely, a kind of biopolitics outweighed a kind of necropolitics. Or, as Sherry Apple, the human rights activist I mentioned before, ZANU-PF are scared of their dead. So in the end, the uncertainty is provoked by the talk of materiality. This excessive potentiality of human remains exceeded or overwhelmed its own political utility. Now, I could read out my conclusion, but I don't think there's any point. That's kind of where the end is, unless you really want me to, but we will stop there. So who wants to start with questions? So I don't know if you have, I don't know how you look at that or... Um, yeah, I, I think that's part of the story, but I think it goes deeper than that. And I think that for several reasons. Firstly, I'm, I actually think the sort of forensic approach and divination are not as different as they like to claim they are. Right? So difference itself, where you draw that line of difference, becomes a political issue. I think everyone in this debate had a very big interest for saying, look, they're very different. Right? The war veterans saying, we are supporting African culture. That suits them. Right? The human rights and the forensic people saying, yes, you know, it's, it's actually a, this kind of way you draw that line of difference becomes a political issue. But when you actually you know, look at what is involved, and this is where I would defer perhaps to people who've spent more time working with forensics, but from what I've read, Zoe Crossland's work, um, also Lady Renshaw, is that 
and, and I have talked to a few people involved in the stuff. Actually, the forensic stuff doesn't become, it's, it becomes very uncertain. It becomes, you know, forensics only work in the context. And actually, you could make an argument that divination, spirit possession is all about context. Right, so actually, I think they, they're not so different. There's a politics to defining that difference. So that's one. I also think the uncertainty runs deeper because I think the uncertainty is, a, is an ontological uncertainty. What you're pointing to is, if you like, an epistemological uncertainty. Right? Different ways of making meaning, right? Different worldviews, if you like. But I think that actually there is a, a more ontological uncertainty here about the relationship between stuff and non stuff. About, and, and actually, in, in, in the other paper that I'm writing, and this is part of the larger book project, is I think that death actually, the argument I'm leaning towards is that death reveals this profound ontological uncertainty. Because there is this stuff that is of us but not us. Right? So in this profound, it really raises this question of what is the relationship between stuff and the material and the immaterial, and it doesn't resolve it. Um, yeah, I mean, I could say more, but maybe I'll stop there. I mean, I, I don't know if you agree or if you... No, I, I, I understand what you... I mean, that's like... I mean, it's true. I, I look at it from an epistemological, epistemological mm -hmm. uncertainty, but that's also because in the end, for me, it's very difficult to make a step towards only thinking from the material. Yeah. So I, yeah. I in the end, always look at ways of making mm. meaning through discourse. Mm. I don't know. And the, my other question was also related to that. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, um, because if you s you said in the beginning, okay, your question is what do the bones do mm. instead of what what mm. they mean, right? Yeah. And then at a certain moment you said, well, they have been exhuming for a long time. Yeah. But it was only later, like in the last ten or twenty mm. years, that there has been publicity yeah. and public interest. So, how does that relate to your question of what the bones do? Yeah. Yeah. If <laughs> no, 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 no. And, and yeah. it's, it's a very important question and well spotted. Yeah, well spotted that. Because, it, and it relates very much to your other questions, is that, you know, I don't think the uncertainty I'm talking about is an ontological one, uh, is an is a epistemological one, I think it's an ontological one. That's not to say that there aren't epistemological uncertainties. And one of the big issues I've had to deal with, and I'm still dealing with, is that there's a huge amount of new literature on death in Africa which points to the fact that death has changed in Africa. And it's changed an awful lot. So the meaning of death, meanings of death, the practices of death have changed. You know, if you look at, there's a fantastic, very large project led by someone called Megan Vaughan in Cambridge and Rebecca Lee looking at changing death in Africa. And they've, everything that they've published points to the fact that death has profoundly changed over the last hundred years. Right? So, in conversations that I've had with them, they would always say, you know, you're pointing to a kind of something that hasn't changed. But I think everything has changed. Right? So, in a sense, there is history going on here. The epistemologies have changed. There are <coughs> multiple epistemologies in play. This does contribute to the uncertainty. So. At the same time, however, I think across these changes, there are continuities. Right? So one of the examples I would cite, and in the introduction that I've drafted for this book, I, I actually cite it. One of the things that the people working on changing death in Africa often point to is to say, well, everyone seems to assume that death and burial is about the politics of belonging and autochthony, and that graves are about identifying who belongs where and therefore they're about land, land ownership. And they say, well, actually, you know, if you look, go back 100 years, all these people who are now using graves and burials to claim land, 100 years ago, they never buried people. They used to expose them and let them be devoured by hyenas. A very specific example from Kenya, for example. Right? So they would say, look, you know, you can't make a sort of an ahistorical argument about the importance of, of funerals, graves, and land ownership and autochthony and belonging because it never used to happen. So, I would admit that that's changed, but what I would point to would be to say, well, there is a continuity here because the stuff of it is still problematic. 
the reason, if you go back historically, the reason that in that example, the Meru of Kenya used to dispose of their bodies by putting them in the bush and letting them de be devoured by hyenas was exactly because the bodily stuff was polluting and dangerous. Right? So in the, while this has changed, colonial laws, etc., etc., now they are burying their bodies in the ground and they're using it for land. That issue of the problematic nature of these leaky bodies is still at the heart of this. Do you see what I mean? So if you like, and you know, there's loads of things going on, but there's legal colonial laws, there's Christianization and all of this. So if you like, all the epistemologies, the practices of death have changed, but the ontological problem to do with the stuff of human remains and the decomposition, actually there's a continuity there. And it's actually, you know, there's a much bigger argument here to do with continuity and change, which is to say that we can only really understand a change by relating it in, in reference to a continuity. Do you see what I mean? So, if, to go back to your very specific example, um, bones and bodies, yes, in the exhumations, war vessels have been doing this for a long time. Um, it's been an issue for a long time, and yet it's also been heightened in the last 10 years. And this is because the context has changed. Yeah? Yeah. So there is a continuity, but there's also a change. Very long way of saying that. <laughs> I also have a question, maybe relating a little bit to, to those last comments. Mm -hmm. And how do you think the case of Zimbabwe then relates uh, to to other neighboring countries or Africa, or completely different countries? Do you see continuity also in space uh, compared to in time? Yeah. And are the uncertainties that you talk about also used politically in other countries in which way? Uh, yes and yes. Um, I mean, at a very basic level, I kind of pointed to this liberation heritage thing. The issue of legacies of liberation, what to do with these, you know, the legacies of struggle in terms of heritage is, exists, coexists across the region. You know, if you go to South Africa, Everyone who works in South Africa in the last 10, 15 years talks about a heritage boom. And a lot of this heritage turns on, if you like, the heritage of apartheid. And one very significant aspect of that is to do with the bodies. There's a woman called Nikki Rousseau who's done a lot of work on, there's a d disappeared unit in South Africa who have been looking for these people who have disappeared in, in, in South Africa. If you look at Namibia, very similar things going on. Um, I think it's going on everywhere, but of course, in every manifestation, it has its own unique dimensions. I have a student working on Rwanda. Now, Rwanda is, at one level, completely unique. On another level, it's not that unique. And I think there's actually more work to be done on this. It's one of the things, I'm, I'm moving to Kenya, as I said before. I'm moving to Kenya. One of the first things I want to do is to have a look more at this regional perspective. So, at one level, the continuity across the place is this politics of liberation and the role of bodies in this. More specifically, the uncertainties. Politics of uncertainty. Yes. And I keep thinking about this more and more. This idea of political accidents and you know, rumours of uh, assassinations does reappear across the region. And uh, every day I hear of more, come across more cross-references to this. I've just been reading a book about political assassinations in Kenya, for example. Part of my becoming aware of Kenya thing going on. And yeah, you know, there's this book called The Risk of Knowledge, it's all about assassination, and I suspect there's that going on. The other obvious example, which only really fell into my face, if you like, recently was Argentina. And one of the difficult things I had to do at this conference in Argentina was give closing comments. Now, you know, I've been in Argentina for four days, they have a highly sophisticated, you know, discourse on memory going on here, and they expected us to sum up everything that was going on. Kind of a challenge, but what I was most struck by, and this is what I talked about, was how the notion of the disappeared has this high prominence. And it seemed to me that there was a profound paradox there, between on the one hand, the, the, the mothers of the disappeared, the children of the disappeared, the grandparents of the disappeared, they're all kind of celebrated. The disappeared are kind of celebrated. They're kind of fixed into a state of indeterminacy. 
Um, and one of the questions that I had to raise, and I'm not sure, I, it got lost in translation, which is just as well, because there were loads of children that disappeared in the audience, right? was whether this celebrated commiseration of the incompleteness of the disappearing really did what it seems to offer, which is to reverse the deliberate indeterminacy imposed upon them by the hunter. Right? If the hunter deliberately, you know, the hunter didn't, you know, again, my limited knowledge on Argentina, but it's very clear that the hunter didn't just kill people. They disappeared them actively, as indeed happens elsewhere, right, in loads of other places. They did this deliberately. By, in the memorial complex, by celebrating them as disappeared, because you can't acknowledge that they're dead, because that would be to acknowledge an un something that's unacceptable. <coughs> are you reversing this deliberate uncertainty, or are you reifying it? Are you, in a sense, complicit with the violence of the hunter? It's a very difficult question, but I think it points exactly to how this uncertainty takes place elsewhere. At one level, the uncertainty is a deliberate political ploy. On the other hand, it also allows its own subversion, but it's never complete. Yeah. Well, I think, I think that's a really interesting point. And I think actually the, the, the division between the Madres de Plaza de Mayo, so yeah. there's one, the Linea Fundadora versus Asociación, mm -hmm. the ones that reclaim um, or publicly want a return of the body, and mm. without the return of the body, they have to, they're considered to be of course, and there will be no return of the body, mm. which is a very much a political stance, yeah. but, and I think that reflects some of what you're saying. Mm. Um, I think it's also, could, could be interesting to think about um, that the position that the desaparecido in Argentina or in Chile has, mm. for example, in, in relation to Spain, so in Spain where there's this attempt to um, reclaim those that were killed or assassinated as disappeared, but then the complexity of the Spanish case and the uncertainty surrounding the different categories of the dead, so whether you were, uh, you died in battle or whether you were disappeared or you were uh, killed for political, I mean there's a lot of uncertainty mm -hmm. um, and the inability to, f to kind of fit that discourse into this other model of the desaparecido. Yes. Um, is also not yeah. really sure what my point is other than saying yeah. it's an interesting kind of... And, and this you know, is one of the things I was thinking about in Argentina because in a sense by reifying the disappeared as disappeared you're erasing the fact that you know, are all of these disappeared innocent? You know, were they not militants? Were some of these militants not, you know, there's a lot of terrorism going on you know, the, you know, it, you know by keep, you're kind of brushing over the uncertainties by keeping them as uncertain Kind of ironic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that seems very much to what to be what you're talking about. Is in a sense by keeping them vague, you avoid the really difficult questions. Mm -hmm. And and you know, I guess to come back to your issue, my student who's working on Rwanda, right? What what she's been working on is state efforts to exhume and memorialize these bodies, thousands of bodies. And she did amazing field work. Mm -hmm doing these for NACA accident, washing these bones. And one of the things that's really striking is that these bones are being washed, they're being made into a new kind of collective dead. So villagers, women who are the survivors who are doing this, they often come across people that they know. And then they kind of submit them to this collective dead. It's like they're rubbing out individuality. Right? And that too is a kind of uncertainty, right? or at least playing with it. And it, what, what's difficult with uncertainty is that it crosses all the levels, right? And I guess the best way to think about it is this tension between you determine them into something, this tension between determination and indeterminacy. Indeterminacy demands determination, but any kind of determination just reveals the inherent uncertainties involved. And I think this also points to one of your comments during the presentation that all the practices of memory in, in a way are incomplete. Yes. There is no closure. Yes. It's also with exhumations and reburials. Mm -hmm. So, also what, what is happening in Argentina, mm -hmm. it is difficult to find a way to 
to determine or to be certain about so, any yeah. practice of memory. So. No, I agree, and it's a, it's it's. See, you know, in some way, the human rights kind of standard line is we need exhumations, we need closure, but not now. We can't do it now, it's too political. When the politics sorts itself out, then we'll do this closure. But I think, I wonder if they're pegging too much on this. I, I don't think there can be closure. Or at least, to slightly reframe that, whatever closure exists can always potentially be undone. So and that's what I mean by saying there is no, there is, it's always incomplete. And in Zimbabwe, there are loads of good examples of this, right? So the family that I've known and lived and done field work with for since 1995, when I was there for a long period of field work, 2005-06, suddenly one of the aunts who had HIV and has since died, um, whose whole family had died of AIDS, was on her own. And so suddenly all these things started happening. Her brother became very sick, became mad. Uh, she became very sick, all these things, and eventually she became possessed by her father, who was from Mozambique, right? And her father said, you've got to bring me from Mozambique and deal with me and sort this out, right? So this is someone who died years and years and years and years before, who suddenly, out of the blue, reappears and disturbs people's lives, right? In very profound ways. And because you have this ancestral thing going on, the dead really do come back. And that, in a sense, is, you know, that's a very specific, very specific epistemology, very specific, if you like, ontology, in the sense that the dead coexist all the time. And yet, it's illustrative of how death is never really complete. It can always, can always come back. Another example I was thinking about recently when I was teaching. I was teaching on Masada. There's this wonderful article on Masada. You know, Masada in Israel. 2,000 years after Masada falls, it suddenly becomes this profound issue and highly contested in, a, in the middle of the 20th century. Right? There's a sense in which there is no closure. And perhaps the only closure is for forgetfulness. Right? But even then, I don't know. Not really. I personally think that this Masada thing has to do a lot more with the pol contemporary politics of the country, doesn't it? Of course it does. And, yeah. and well, you said before that uh, uh, in these exhumations in Chibunda, uh, they are always in between this a war grave and, and a, a crime scene, mm -hmm. I think you said. Mm -hmm. and. Well, and I'm all the time comparing it to the Spanish case, but I think in Spain it's exactly the same point. And, and within the uh, historical memory associations and everything, there, there is this division of we either should do it like in the legal way mm -hmm. with judge and police and everything else, or, or we're talking about this as, as it's in the past and it's over. And, and we are either within the same time period or we're separate from it, you know, and I think that it's the same, it's the same division that we make in Israel or anywhere else. Yeah, I agree, and it, I think, I mean, it's always linked to contemporary politics, right? Um, the point is, I guess, is that the excessiveness of this stuff always defies that. It makes it available for contemporary politics, but it also defies it. Do you see what I mean? And that's why you know, inevitably, whatever was going on in the Zada 2,000 years ago and what's going on in the middle of the 20th century is completely different. And yet, it's the excessiveness of that possibility that allows it to be, to animate politics across yeah, such course. different contexts. Mm -hmm. So, at the moment, the issue of Chibondo is a crime scene or a war grave, you know, and everything that falls from that. But there may be, in, you know, in, in 20 years' time, it may be a completely different kind of terrain, mm -hmm. and it will still be doing this stuff. Um. To, to kind of go back to um, Maria's point, it's interesting to know that the, kind of this excessive potentiality, mm -hmm. I mean, it really points to the ways in which the uh, epistemological and the um, ontological are kind of 
interweaved. Yes. I mean, it's. I'm just thinking, like, it's, it's hard to, especially when you're talking about the political utility, it's hard to escape these issues of discourse and how um, arguments are made or st claims are made. I don't know. It, it's an interesting kind of... Yeah. Um, I couldn't agree more with you, actually. And I think in, in another piece, I mean, the ontological term in anthropology caused loads of people to get extremely upset. And particularly the introduction to that book, Thinking Through Things, upset everyone. And I think one of the reasons it's upset everyone is exactly this point. Because in that introduction, they make a very hard distinction between epistemology and ontology. And they kind of say, you know, epistemology is old school, we need to do ontology. Right? That's kind of what they're saying. And then they also dress this up with all sorts of kind of emancipatory rhetoric which, you know, really upset people, right? We are, you know, you guys are all basically ethnocentric and we're better than you, blah, blah, blah. Now, the conceit within that is, of course, around questions of consciousness. Because as soon as you introduce a question of consciousness in this, it can no longer be ontology, according to the way that they've constructed this, right? So if, as soon as someone becomes aware that their understanding is different from someone else's, they're aware of the difference, it's no longer ontology, it's epistemology, right? Um, except, of course, for the anthropologists. And this is why people were so upset, I think, with that book, with that thinking through things. It's also why some of the authors of that introduction, particularly Martin Holbrad, has pulled back from it. I've talked to him a couple of times about this, and he's actually pulled back from some of the extremes of that particular position because of the conceit within it. Because basically, at the end, you deny consciousness to everyone except the, the anthropologist. The anthropologist is the only one who is aware of the difference between different ontologies. Which is an incredibly conceited position. And I think that you know, took a while uh, for, for that to be worked out, if you like. So actually, I think in the field, differentiating between an epistemology and ontology is actually very hard. So I think you're absolutely right. Um, I also think, you know, given that the ontological term is all about difference, I find it inconceivable to think of a difference that isn't about politics. So, you know, it's one of the... I wrote a paper in response to this. This is the co lecture that you mentioned earlier uh, on Gray's Ruins and Belonging. And, you know, that was... I really kind of used that as a moment to take these guys on. And what I'm interested in is the political dimensions of ontology. Which means, you're right, it's completely intertwined with the possible epistemology. That's a good question. Yeah. The other thing, oh, well, it's more of just a comment, but I think it's interesting, the, um, this idea of excess mm -hmm. uh, of human remains in some of the literature, especially when Chris Penny's work on yeah. photography. I mean, thinking about images, especially those images that you, you show at the beginning, they're kind of... Yeah. It's unruly, like yeah. how do you control them, contain them, and that's also linked to the question of politics and Yeah, I haven't done enough work on visual anthropology, so I, I need to think about this. I was reminded of this recently, but I think you're right. Um, the excessiveness of this. And, and, it, and it's this excessiveness that causes all sorts of problems. I mean. When I was writing the Tortured Bodies piece, for example, in 2008, at these elections, the reason the rest of the world became aware of this is because the human rights groups were very active on the ground. And they took photos of all these people who had been beaten, you know, had their life kicked out of them. And they took very graphic photos of these open sores, you know, so suddenly, anyone who watches this in Bobby, thousands of these horrific photos of people who had been tortured, you know, living people, not, you know, they were dead as well, but living people, you know, being burnt, it's just horrific. Now, at one level, in all of those cases, the human rights people said, look, the victims allowed themselves to be photographed because they wanted to put them out to undo this. But it always struck me that there's an excessiveness to these images because, in a sense, they were doing Xanopia's work for them. Right? I mean, if you beat up one person in a group of ten and do it in such a visible way, then you don't need to beat up the other ten. Right, so, and yet they were trying to subvert that. And of course both those things were going on, and I think that points to the excessiveness of this stuff, of the images. 
Well, and that inability to kind of control how yes. they're going to be used to make meaning. Yeah, exactly. But this excessiveness of, of the materials and the images linked to those materials is also, it has a lot of, of a creative power, no? Mm -hmm. It's not only, I don't know, maybe, maybe excessive is a bit of a negative word, I'm not sure, in English. But it has Depends a lot of like creative excess. power, creates these courses and, mm -hmm. and different interpretations about, about those remains. And the uncertainty in this way is also creative. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, it, in fact, I was thinking about that. I've been thinking about that in terms of this chapter on political accents that I'm writing. Because, you know, by emphasizing the uncertainty that, a, say, this guy, you know, who dies in a political accident, you know, has an accident, people think it's an assassination, but it's not. A lot of these guys become national heroes. Right? So the uncertainty of death, in that sense, enables the constitution of a particular kind of dead person, a hero, right? So it's mm -hmm. enabling, mm -hmm. as well as eliminating, mm -hmm. constraining. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the, the broader point I'm pointing at, which everyone I think is pointing at when they're working on this materiality stuff, is that we've always tended to assume that the material is pretty obvious and it's the immaterial that's problematic. And actually, it seems to me that the material is just as problematic as the immaterial, and in fact the two are totally related. And this is really where we get to that kind of delusion point of where matter and meaning are, you know, you can't really separate the two. Hmm, but how then do you explain the fact that you, for instance, look at human remains as less stable hmm. than objects, for instance? Like, for me, when you say that, you posit them between object and disclosure, between object and... I mean, if you can I mean, I, categorize I would, in more stable or less stable and... I, I would say that human remains are less stable than objects. I think that that's the wrong question. I'll talk about things for a start. Mm -hmm. Once a thing is an object, it's already been stabilized as an object. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's why I talk about stuff and things and materials rather than objects and subjects. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. because, uh, um, it's a difficult question, you know, and it's one I kind of point to, is that at one level, stuff is stuff is stuff. And the humanness of stuff is, you've already determined it as humanness, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just stuff. So once you've, you've identified it as human stuff, it's already, in a sense, stabilized into something. So a lot of this, I think, turns on questions of recognition. That's why. But what I think is interesting about human stuff is that it's actually contained in the word, right? It's human stuff. It's this ambivalent subject object hood that they are constituted into. If it just remains stuff, you know, if you if the, you come across a pile of skulls but you see them as stones, they're just stones or stuff, wouldn't be so problematic. It's the moment where you recognise that they're kind of human, that it becomes problematic because it's kind of human, but it's not human. Do you see what I mean? So it's, it's about recognition. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does make sense. I mean, I really like your argument about presence. Mm. And, well, maybe later you can tell me, like, what your, like, the presence mm. of, of human remains and, and to see them as a metonym instead of a metaphor, and that's what makes them mm. much more there and much less, much more defied or, or mm. unstable in meaning. I think that there's a point there, but I'm still, I mean, yeah, I'm, uh, for me to, to draw these differences, and it is true that people go in the grave and then you see an object and, and that's what stabilizes meaning because that's what, what we know and, and while the, the human remain, maybe it is between subject and object or it's, it's, it's too recognizable, too close to yourself or I don't know, I mean, it's difficult to find ways to explain why why there is that problem with human remains versus objects that you might find in the same way. Uh, where was I going? Um, yeah, but then, instability. For instance, in your grave, I see it very much, but in a Spanish war, civil war grave, I see much more stability in the human remains that are exhumed because 
they're not anymore leaking, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're not stinky. Uh, they're just bones, ma mainly, and sometimes there is some object found. Um, Mostly, there is also not very much uncertainty about the, the case of the, the, the cause of death. Um, is that because of work that's been done to determine the before the exhumation? Or is that not because? Well, because it's been done very professionally now. So. Because for, uh, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that forensics rarely do an exhumation unless they already know who they're digging up. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, I mean, in, in Spain, most exhumations take place because the family members mm. ask for them to be exhumed. Right. So you know you're looking for a father or a father. Yeah. So you do know who you're looking for most of the time, more or less. Yeah, yeah. But it's, but it's also interesting, I mean, for example, this week in Madrid, they did the, the first exhumation that they've done uh, in, in the city of Madrid, and it was in a cemetery. So, which means that the, the bodies were already predetermined. I mean, they were doc the grave had been documented. How many bodies were in? What were the names of the people? Um, and yet, in the exhumation itself, there was an incredible amount of insecurity about being able to attach a name to the bones without DNA. Mm -hmm. You know, and the and the question of we can't know for sure until which in part is interesting because it has to do with the kind of the process in which exhumations have been professionalized mm -hmm. in Spain and the awareness of, of family members of the power of DNA over just claiming the bones. Um, but it was also difficult to, you know, like for example, the people that were from the city of Madrid that are the ones that manage all of the cemeteries, they were saying, well, this is certain. We have the book, we have the documentation, yeah, yeah. so this is, you know, and so these debates. Yeah, so you have, a, I guess, a debate between different forms of determination, between the book, the ledger, and the DNA scientists, both of which, of course, are contextual. I mean, I don't know enough about this, but there's work on, I went to a conference on DNA recently. I mean, you know, you get my DNA, it will tell you nothing until you find something to prepare it against, right? I mean, DNA is by its definition. I mean, it's also interesting because it's <coughs> substance and code, right? I mean, I've, I've, that's why I find DNA interesting because as soon as, as soon as you, it's all about substance, but as soon as you have the code, the substance disappears. It's kind of interesting, mm -hmm. um, and I think there are people working on this. Um, but I, I mean, going back to your question, I think there is a difference. Between, this is a question we spent a lot of time thinking about, or I spent a lot of time thinking about a few years ago when I was writing the tortured bodies paper. I think there is a difference between finding a skeleton in your garden and finding someone who can act death in the garden, right? There's a profound difference between the two, which is kind of what you're saying, mm. right? And it's to do with the, the leaky, smelly, yuckiness of it. And, and you see this in other cases where people, you know, people talk about, you know, these bones were fine until I found a bit of hair <laughs> or a bit of skin, and then suddenly it all went really <clears throat> yucky, right? And so and we're talking here about the kind of qualitative sensual engagement with this. And I, I wonder whether it's to do with the fact that bones somehow seem more stable. I don't think they necessarily are, mm -hmm. but they seem. Mm -hmm. um, and of course this then falls into questions of like, well, where does the body begin and end? This is one that my student Laura has had a lot to do with, right? When she's been doing these, when they're digging up these mass graves from in Rwanda to they're cleaning the bones. And one of the problems that she talks about is like they were digging up, they never they never know when to stop digging. They've exhumed all the kind of these bodies, a lot of them were buried, you know, immediately after genocide in the so months that followed. And now, <coughs> twenty years on, they're being exhumed and being cleaned, and all the you know, skulls in one corner, all the leg bones in another, and putting in this new monumentalized memorials all over the country, right? And the people doing this are in these graves digging, but they never know how far to dig. Right? Or how much to clean. Because if you clean too much, then, the, the, you know, do you kind of, the soil that's inside a bone, right? The stuff. I mean, is that of the person or is it not? So it, it relates again to this process of, and I think it's interesting because it relates exactly to what kind of Ingold is talking about when he's talking about transforming materials. 
when do you get to the bottom of the grave? Is the soil around it, is that a person? It kind of is. And it kind of isn't. Um, so I think that it kind of points to that issue. And the, the, you know, this idea that a skeleton is less problematic than a fleshy body is really because it's a kind of a lie, I suspect. Because we assume that the skeleton is somehow more stable. Although my limited experience is that that does really depend again on context. You know, skeletons, in a sense, skeletons have to be made to be stable exactly through excavation work. There's a wonderful paper by Elizabeth Hallam, you know, an issue that we put out a few years ago in the Journal of Material Culture, where she's looking at these, in the 19th century, these this new kind of profession emerged of people who put um, anatomical specimens together. You know, the kind of skeleton you see in a doctor's thing, right? And what she's really pointing to is the fact that, you know, actually this is a, 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 this kind of profound reconstitution of the skeleton. And that this becomes a real skill, right? And in a sense, that's exactly what exhumation is. Right? So that is the assumed stability of the skeleton is is a construct. Does that? Yeah, that makes sense. Um. But then again, assuming is also creates more instability and uncertainty. So. But this is—I think I want to pursue this more. This idea, because it's. Mm. But the idea that the more you, more something seems determined, the more stark the uncertainties become too. Mm -hmm. So, in this theoretical problem of uh, ontology and epistemology, mm -hmm. what uh, I understood is that there would be an inherent ontological in the in the terminacy. So maybe epistemological activity would be a form or a way to determination. So you will have a substance that is indeterminated and a code trying to determine something. And in this problem you will find a political battle, I suppose, between different codes trying to be the, the real and the truth. No? So it will be all around the truth, no, and this the activity of determination, no? Yeah, no, I think you're right. Um, I think that, uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think, you know, the ontological problem feeds into epistemological problems where these contests take place. I think the only problem with that analysis, I haven't really finished thinking about this, maybe you can help me, is that there's a tendency amongst the people who do the ontology stuff to assume that politics only happens at the level of epistemology. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And I think the danger of where you're going with that is that that's what... But I, don't, I think that doesn't work. So the example that I used in this other paper that I've written is to say, you know, if it's about belonging and claiming land, you know, if you say, this is my land, I have access to it and I have rights over it that you don't, because I'm of the land, because my forefathers are buried in it because my forefathers are the land, right? Because they are buried and decomposed in it, so they become the soil. And in, in Zimbabwe, people talk about ancestors as Ifu, which means soil. I mean, that's a political claim. It's also an ontological claim. Yeah. You know, I am ontologically, my being and my relationship with this land is ontologically different to yours because my, do you see what I mean? There's, there's an ontological dimension to that claim. It's also a political one. So that's the kind of the example. Or I mean, the other example that I thought, you know, sometimes people say, white people can't be affected by the witchcraft. And that kind of, that's, I know, I had need to, I'd love to, witchcraft is fascinating, right? And it's probably been overstudied in anthropology, so, but I haven't quite worked out how that works, but it does point to a sort of, there's a profound difference of being. And ontology is about the nature of the world, right? It's about the nature of being, the nature of existence. Um, it's intensely political.
But I think you're right. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying you're wrong. I just think the danger is kind of following through that. Yeah, way. for sure. I wasn't saying that politics is in the epistemological no, yeah. side. Maybe uh, there are these two sides, and politics is the yeah. line that crosses. Yeah, I think that I think I think I'd agree with that. Um, yeah, like that. yeah, yeah. I think I'd agree with that. Uh, definitely. And then, uh, could you explain the relation between biopolitics and necropolitics? Because they seem to be uh, the two sides of uh, the same coin. Yeah. Uh, you say this in English. <laughs> yeah, they are, and you know, th this is where this is the kind of stuff political anthropologists, you know, they build their career on this kind of debate. You know, I mean, classically, biopolitics is the kind of Foucauldian stuff, right? Um, which at, at an individual level is about the constitution of subjectivity through discourse, but at a kind of population level, uh, it's, it, you know, at that other level, biopolitics bio really works at that kind of population level. Necropolitics is kind of, you know, so in other words, it's about, you know, the politics that's involved in making life possible. Right. Necropolitics is then assumed to be the opposite, which is you know determined by determining who dies. Right. And classically, my understanding of it is that Michel Foucault, you know, take for example his Discipline and Punish, very famous, is probably the most famous work, where he, he posits this historical move from punishment as a spectacle to punishment as reform. Right? And he generalizes that as really to say there's you know, a move, there's a history here from power which is about asserting uh, coercion mm. to power as reforming, productive power. Now, of course he's wrong and people always say he's wrong in the sense that there wasn't this historical moment. Is that the way it's yeah I mean how, you know in other words he was a shit historian. You know, he was a great thinker but he wasn't a very good historian right? Yeah. Um, because of course both things are going on all the time I mean when the president of the USA goes anywhere he flies with two airplanes, a car, a helicopter now is this just functional or is this demonstrative it's demonstrative uh, yeah he also has to make sure he's not using too many resources he has to be legitimate right a classic example um, this you know both things are going on at the same time. That's how I understand it. Uh, and so then, you know, there's this whole thing, ne necropolitics, as Shilin Bembu works on it, he really works with the gambling stuff. Right? And there's this real question, is a gambling anti Foucault? It's, it's kind of the inverse, but they're really they're in the same kind of field. Yeah. Right? Is that, I mean, that's how I understand it. But I'm, I'm conscious that my political anthropology colleagues you know, they, they build their careers talking about this stuff. <laughs> uh, and one of the, I think one of the broader things that I'm trying to do in this book and in my work more generally is to try and cross a divide here, right? You've got the material culture, ontology, phenomenological anthropology folk all obsessed with the materiality term in its broadest manifestations. And then you've got the political anthropologists talking about endlessly about biopolitics and necropolitics. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm most often struck by how these two groups of anthropologists ever talk to each other. Right? So the classic, you know, I think Tim and God is fantastic. I think he's re-centered anthropology, and I think it's only going to be recognized in about 20 years' time just of what he's done. Right? If the center of anthropology is here, he's there. And because he's there, it's moved here. And I think people are not going to, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't really speak to anthropologists. He's, Archaeologists listen to him. Art historians listen to him. You know, anthropologists kind of think he's a bit weird, right? And the mainstream anthropologists. But there's a massive problem with Ingold, which is that he doesn't understand. He doesn't really do politics. At the same time, if you look at the political anthropologists, and of course I'm generalising here, right? But the, nevertheless, there's some truth in this. If you look at the political anthropologists, I think their fallback position is still a politics of representation. That's the fallback position, right? They fall back on a kind of social constructivism. That's why, you know, if you look, you know, Foucault still dominates. And it's kind of annoying. I mean, Foucault's brilliant, but he's not the only thinker out there, right? 
And it's really annoying, you know, people just assume that. That's why, and I th so I think there is a, a kind of a gap there, and of course there's many people in the middle, but it's that middle space that I think is very interesting. Mm -hmm. and that's kind of where I would situate it. <coughs> For me, in philosophy, uh, Foucault would be this political thinker, uh -huh. and Deleuze would be the ontological way to complete. No? I think Foucault Deleuze yes. is, yes. would be yeah. the perfect thing, you know, to <laughs> explain many things. Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> right, and I think, yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. I mean, Deleuze has had a, a really big impact now. So maybe that gap that I'm, is maybe it's less big now than, mm. than I'm suggesting. And then you said something about change and continuity. Maybe I will try to, I don't know how, but I will try to explain continuity through change and not the other way. No? You said that you will explain change, you will explain yeah. change, no, through continuity. Maybe I will try to, Maybe the other way. I mean, I, I think ultimately it's, I don't know how it's vice versa. I think I think you're right. It's not just that we understand change through reference to continuity. We also understand continuity of reference to change. And in fact, I guess I've been thinking a little bit about Deleuze. I'm not very good on Deleuze. It's very difficult. <laughs> but Deleuze on time, right? I mean, if you want to do a heading, read Deleuze on time. A wonderful article by someone on rethinking. The arrow of time. It's worth looking at. It's looking at Deleuze and Bergeson on time. Um, and I think you're right in the sense that you know time is change. Becoming. Yeah, exactly. There is, so in a sense, there's only change, but we become aware of time because things change at different rates. So you know. Uh, you know, we become aware of change because something changes, something else appears not to. In fact, everything is constantly changing, but change, things change at different rates, so therefore some things appear to endure and other things seem to change quickly. What we're talking about are different speeds of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of this change continuity argument is, is me writing against or towards Africanists, and particularly Africanist historians. Mm -hmm. Because they've been deeply up, uh, obsessed with this, you know, the fallout of the invention of tradition debates and the invention of ethnicity debates has had a, a long impact. So the fallback tends to be that, well, you know, and you can see it in the way in which the whole field is structured. We have the pre-colonial period, we have the colonial period, and we have the post-colonial period. And there's this assumption of these ruptures in time. And I'm really rallying against that. Not to fall back on the old problematic anthropological position, which is a symbolic one, that there is no time. Well, of course, see, that's deeply problematic. But really, that you need a diachronic and psychonic <coughs> at the same time. And therefore, these ruptures... The continuities across the ruptures are more interesting than the existence of a rupture. Mm -hmm. And as soon as someone posits a rupture, I always think, well, what's continuing? So that's kind of where I'm coming from when I'm doing that. It's, it's quite a deliberate thing because I, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, it's a classic moment. A historian talks to an anthropologist, right? It's, it's almost a stereotypical moment, right? The anthropologists are looking for you know, how this all continues, and the historians are looking for the moment when things change. And a lot of the time, you know, although I'm talking to anthropologists, I'm also a lot of time talking to Zimbabweanists who are dominated by historians. So their retort, you know, to this paper, in fact, is it's all changed. Terence Ranger, when I talked to him about this, he said, when I first came to Zimbabwe in southern Rhodesia, we were all talking about the spirits, and now we're talking about bodies. He's written papers like this. And my assumption was, well, bodies have always mattered, we just haven't been looking in the right place. Right? Actually, we're both kind of true. Hmm. And it, you know, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a classic, we've actually had that conversation several times. Anyone <laughs> um. else? I think we can stop here. Yeah. Thank you. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.